Welcome to Six Pack Philosophy with Mike and John. I'm Anastasia, and this week's discussion is on gambling throughout history and the philosophical concept of gambling choice as a gamble. Yet I can't do this right. I like it. I but like anyway, it. before we get started, what are we drinking, guys? We are drinking Flying Monks by Adelbert's Brewery in Austin, Texas. Oh. It's a handcrafted Belgian-style quadruple. And it's 10.9% alcohol by volume. Oh, we didn't get to have this one when we were down there, did we? They were nope. out. Hey, will you hand me that beer, please? Hold up. Oh, come on. Okay, fine. Um, but anyway, so what we we're going to talk about today... Um, ooh, actually kind of got started. You can have the cork. But I want a beer. Anyway, um, so it kind of got started when I was thinking about this idea that every choice that we make <coughs> is... Thank you. Um, that is very heady. Oh, well. Anyway. Well, you know me. <laughs> I like a little bit of head. Um, but anyway. my beer. Yes. So, um, essentially every choice that we make is, it's a bet that the choice that we make is going to turn out the way that we want it. Um, and whatever we are risking when we make that choice is, is what we are putting up as our side of the bet. Um, interesting idea. That's that, what I thought. That, that, that's why we're calling it life as a gamble? Yes, exactly. Every single choice that you make, so everything that you do in life is a gamble. Um, I haven't tried this beer yet. Somebody talk. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I guess the, the place that we need to start is the history. Um, we've done a little bit of looking into it. You, you seem really excited, Mistress. Do you want to go ahead and start with history? Um, I mean, I suppose we can. So, obviously, um, gambling has been around for a really long time. And, of course, in that, I'm not talking about what we were just talking about, as in every choice that you make is a gamble, but, um, you know, games of chance. And it's really interesting, because what I wanted to look at specifically was um, the history of kind of gambling and gambling laws and perceptions of, of gambling in the United States. And what I found was actually really interesting. Um, you looked at um, the colonists who came over, and what I found was that they were kind of separated into two separate groups, um, one of which who brought through, um, brought from England perceptions that there were certain kinds of gambling that were okay. They were uh, gentlemen's games. And then there were the Puritans who not only um, wanted to outlaw gambling, but they wanted to outlaw things like singing and dancing oh, yeah, and, and basically anything, anything fun. fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the um, ones that went to Virginia, uh, the southern colonies, tended to be much more he heavily into gambling. Right. Horse racing, bowling, mm -hmm. uh, shooting sports, you know, dice, cards. And I think it's worth pointing out when the, the Puritans first outlawed these kinds of things, they not only outlawed gambling, they outlawed any kind of board game or they outlawed only dice or cards. Now, they later eased up on those regulations to allow people to play in a, in a I forget what they call it, non-monetary fashion, we'll say. Yeah, it was, you know... It if you were just playing for fun and you weren't actually betting anything, then it was okay. Well, and it, that doesn't even go back to the idea of gambling as, as to why it was illegal. It, it, you know, it, it was illegal to do anything that was that was considered a waste, leisure time. Right. Uh, man's duty was to work to a Puritan, and, mm -hmm. and, and if what you were doing was not productive, it was a sin. Right. Well, and that actually kind of um, translates then into some tensions that arose between uh, the colonists and their financiers who um, viewed gambling in the colonies as a sign that, uh, you know, they had too much uh, leisure time, they were too idle, um, essentially that they were wasting the time that they had and the money that their financiers were providing to them. Um, and it, it was really interesting because um, it actually came to a point where um, first their financiers actually... Um, petitioned the crown to allow them to hold, hold lotteries um, to fund uh, the colonies. And then um, kind of dovetailing on that, um, the crown then actually started to put um, barriers on any gambling that the colonists wanted, or rather any lotteries specifically that the colonists wanted to have um, without permission from the crown. Well, and, and I, I want to kind of expound upon that a little bit because they there were those who petitioned the crown for uh, permission, who for his blessing in holding these kind of lotteries. Cause it, it, was a, it was a rather common way of, of financing projects. Uh, Yale 
was built with a lottery. Harvard, um, Columbia, Dartmouth, Princeton, William and Mary, like all of the most prestigious a lot of, universities. A lot of churches um, uh, and many government buildings. So while there were those who who reached out and and tried to get permission, there were many who said, I'd rather ask forgiveness than permission, and we're doing it anyway. Those are my kind of people. And so the Crown's response to the the people who did it anyway was to to start to make laws to ban it. Um, It it wasn't so much a response to those who asked permission, because easy enough to say no to them. Right. Well, and what was really interesting is... um, especially if you look at it from a libertarian perspective, um, one of the things that libertarians stand firmly against um, is taxation. Now, some of them say, you know, some taxation is okay. Some of them say that no taxation is okay. Taxation is theft is a thing that you hear a whole lot. However, um, when you look at this, a lot of the public works in the colonies were funded through lotteries, and it actually became kind of viewed as a civic responsibility that you participate in these lotteries. It wasn't so much the idea that if you played, you might hit it big and be set for life, but that you, I mean, there was obviously an element of that, but um, there was this idea that, kind of like we do with raffles now, um, that you put money into it, um, you know, charities come around all the time and they they say, you know, we're going to raffle this stuff off. Five tickets for $20 or whatever it is. Churches, FFA, exactly. uh, all Everything. Stuff. Schools do it a lot. Um, and the idea is not so much that you're going to win whatever the prize is for the raffle, but that you're supporting um, this organization and what they're trying to do. So I'm going to come out and, and just kind of disagree with you. Um, and I'm going to kind of compare uh, uh, colonial history to more modern history when we start to see the re- reemergence of the lottery systems uh, at state levels. Um, in the U.S. again, which was around the uh, 60s, 70s when that started to pick back up and and really took off around the uh, uh, late 70s, early 80s. Um, We saw even then where they were talking about, this is going to fund schools. We're going to fund schools this lottery. We're going to fund all this stuff, and we won't have to raise taxes, which which was the main push to bring them back to the states. And there was even a a small push to bring it to a federal level, but it, it never went anywhere. Um, when you look at the actual behavior of of the people participating in these lotteries, it it's been my perception that people don't participate in the lotteries for their civic duty. Um, people I, use that as a justification to get it through Congress. Oh, I think that's true when you're talking about the large lotteries. Uh, but 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 I, I think Anna's correct when you're talking about these small raffles, these these kind of things. I mean, uh, our, our local FFA holds raffles a whole year on different things, and yeah. I buy all of them. And if I were to win, I wouldn't know what I'd do with the I stuff know, that right? I won. Uh, but, you know, I think there is a, a sense of, of public responsibility in those cases, in the local community raffles and lotteries. Right. Uh, I think in a, in, a, in a larger national or state state lottery, yeah, it's about the money. It is. Well, and the other thing, though, is um, the advertisements that you see for it are, you know, help fund Texas schools, you know. Um, I mean, I can't tell you how many commercials I've seen that tout that um, funds from the lottery go toward public schools. Um, Justification. It, well, yeah. and it is. But they're trying to portray this as your civic duty. Come on, buy a lottery ticket because you're going to help the kids. Now, that might not be most people's um, driving uh, motivation for it, but that is the way that people, uh, the way that the people who are um, advocating for these lotteries are justifying it. Yeah, yeah. justification, not encouragement. Uh, if you were to say that that was encouraging you, then you would say that people smoke and drink because there's a high high sin tax on alcohol and cigarettes. Yeah. Right. Uh, it's my responsibility. I should be helping this stuff. <laughs> yeah, right, uh, right. Which, by the way, I'm thinking about pushing from now on. It is, it is your responsibility to drink more because that sin tax goes to fund the government. Yeah. Everybody mm-hmm. should drink more. Or we should drink less because we want the government to have less time. <laughs> well, and if you're if you're a libertarian, you can you know whenever you smoke, you're funding the government. You must love the government. Damn, I have to quit smoking now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so anyway, um, what I found interesting was something that I hadn't actually really heard much of, <coughs> but that um, these restrictions that the crown was placing um, on the colonies as far as their lotteries and their gambling was concerned was actually a driver. 
um, for independence. It was one of the factors. It was. Uh, you know, we, we've heard all these, these years about uh, the Stamp Act, and mm -hmm. we've been told our whole life that, you know, no taxation without representation, and we were furious about this Stamp Act, and we were, but the Stamp Act put taxes on, on lots of things. The thing that, that, that set the people off, though, was when they started taxing playing cards because that's what they right. used to gamble with. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, you know, I, I think it's interesting. It probably belongs in another podcast, but we talk about the taxation a lot. The taxation was the reason. Well, if you look historically, that taxation was a rate minuscule. of 2 to 3%. Yeah, very, very small. It was minuscule compared to what we do now. And, and I, I think, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that though taxation did play a big part in it, that a bigger part was played by the outright things that the Crown banned and had the soldiers do that it, it wasn't a way for them to pay their way out of it it's like you're going to do x and y and z yeah and you're not allowed to do these things it, it was the regulations it was it was the representation side more than yes. the taxation side right yeah, yeah. Uh, by the way if you haven't heard our, our hard shot on that we did a, a hard shot on taxation without representation real early on like in february or something you could go back mm -hmm. and find that uh, it was yeah. interesting. Yeah, we did. Um, now, something else that I found interesting was that um, whenever the War for Independence actually started, there was a $10 million, it's $10 million lottery that was, uh, that was put out there hoping that the people would actually fund the war effort. Um, that kind of completely, like, fell apart. Well, and, and I've been kind of thinking about this, and maybe I'm, I'm diving into the philosophy side of this, but I love the idea of using a state lottery to fund Project X because I do too. it allows people, uh, first of all, it allows people to get involved and feel like they're getting something for their money. It allows the uh, government to be funded uh, for Project X. and allows Voluntarily. People, yeah, it allows people to protest by saying, yeah, I'm not going to fund that. I'm not going to fund that war. I don't believe, or maybe they do believe in the war. Yeah, you know, we've been using lotteries uh, in, in wars uh, for, for generations, whether we realize it or not. Mm -hmm. What do you think the draft is? I right. mean, essentially, you're putting your name in, and it's a lottery to, decide, to find out whether or not you get to go. But you don't get to choose to participate well, in that lottery. You don't get lottery. to choose to yeah. participate, but it's still a lottery. Right. Yeah. yeah. You're, you're right. You're right. Uh, so, so you've got a situation where we say the federal government doesn't have a gamble and doesn't have a lot. Well, they do. It's, it, it, it's by force. They right. don't have one where you get a monetary gain. Well, and, Not and, significant, yes. And that raises a good point. <laughs> right. the, the issue I have with state lotteries, I think they're, they're generally great, except for that quite often what, what the result is, is the state comes through and says, well, we're going to ban every other kind of lottery because, as we all know, monopolies are bad, unless it's ours. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, do you have any insight, Mike, on, um, <coughs> particularly in Texas, the state lottery funding education? Because I've actually heard rumor um, that that money isn't actually going well, toward the schools. The money does go to the schools, but here's here's the situation: is that our state lottery now? Now my 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 dad is old. It's from when I ran for office, so some of this stuff could have changed. But uh, I know that whenever they were they were looking at all this, the uh, thank you. The way that we set up our lottery in Texas is we have an independent agency that runs it. Texas doesn't run it. We pay somebody an right. independent company to do it. And what happens is when that company makes its money, what's left goes to to fund schools. Well, what they were doing for, for several years there, and, and as far as I know, they still are, I could be wrong, is they were taking the, that excess money and they were bonusing it back out to their employees uh, as, you know, as, as salary, salary increases mm -hmm. and all this stuff. So the money was, in fact, being funneled into this private company, and very little of it was reaching the schools. Right. Well, and, and the other thing I've heard, and this wasn't specific to Texas, but more a, a commentary on on state lotteries that fund education is quite often through various loopholes like the one you described what they do is they bring this money into education they then say we have five million more dollars in education and then they give out those five million dollars in tax breaks to companies who have been lobbying the government so what ends up happening is you you start this state lottery that everybody supported because, you know, maybe this person doesn't necessarily believe in gambling or a lottery, but they want to help the schools, and the schools at the end get the exact same amount of money that they did before the lottery was there. Yeah, yeah. What, what, what they end up doing is that money goes in and then other money comes out. Yeah, right. Yeah. It's, it's right. an offsetting thing. Well, and that was actually uh, the, the basis of what I heard, and I, I called it a rumor because I haven't actually checked it myself. 
um, but that Texas in their budget has a, a reappropriation clause, I believe is what it's called, um, which means that if you get money from this source and it supplements what you were going to be getting anyway, then the money that you were going to be getting anyway um, is is kind of cut and well, that's moved not, somewhere else. But, Yes, that is true. It's not just to the lottery, though. That's that's true mm -hmm. for all kinds of things. If, if your right. if your local district aren't, raises so much money, it cuts into the amount you get from the state, right. and part of that money is lottery money. Right. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, um, this kind of actually brings us to something else that I wanted to talk about. Um, was this use of <coughs> the lottery? Um, as a substitute for taxation. Um, I kind of wanted to get y'all's thoughts on, um, it, you know, I found it funny because you actually see these memes and things like that online, um, or at least you do in our circles, of, um, you know, before, and I don't remember what year it was, sometime in the early 1900s, there was no income tax and we were growing at, at this rate and things were so much better. Um, and then, of course, looking into the history of this, you see that a lot of public works were funded by lotteries. Um, so would it be reasonable, you know, we've talked in the past about, you know, flat tax versus fair tax, and would it possibly be reasonable to fund all public works through things like a lottery? Y yes and no. And, you know, I think there, there's a central question here that gets ignored in the uh, in the whole debate on on whether we should even have an income tax. And that is, quite honestly, uh, uh, shooting it straight, there is absolutely no way the government we have now could survive without an income tax. It could not happen. It couldn't survive <coughs> on a voluntary mean. It couldn't s survive on a, a import-export tax. The importance there is the government we have now. Yeah, right. I'm okay yeah. with that. So we, we, we have to have another debate of, is the government we have now, is this... This government that does so much for the people, and we could argue over how much they do and, and whether it's good, but I think this argument that needs to be had is, is the level of government we have now necessary? And if you come down on that and you say, yeah, we need all this government, or even to a more extreme extent that we need more government then you have to have an income tax. You cannot have one without the other. Now, if you come down on that and say, we need less government, uh, we could survive with less government, I, I, I think you start to get into an area where you can start to say, okay, maybe this income tax isn't necessary, and, and you know, what can we do instead? Yeah, it's interesting to me as, as to whether or not we could, the lottery could replace something. Uh, my, my question is, and, and I'm, not a, I'm not a statistics kind of guy, I know statistics and economic models are really good at predicting things, right. but I wonder how effective they would be in predicting the amount of people that participate in the lottery over a period of time. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I just, I'm curious about that. That would be interesting to see for sure. Well, there's a lot of data on it. Um, I, I don't, I don't have the data, and, and I haven't looked at it. But um, they, they've even had data on. Uh, I, I was reading about it, and I forget which one, but it was Yale and Harvard, and one of their lotteries did really well, and one did really poorly, and it had to do with conditions at the time. I think there was a competing government lottery to fund a war at the time. Um, how, how big a lottery they tried to do at a time? How often the payouts were? So we have extensive data on what makes a lottery work, what doesn't make a lottery work and um, how to make it work and, and then how many people you know participate depending on what kind of lottery it is so I would say probably yes but I don't have those numbers yeah to yeah uh, well it was it would stand a reason that it could uh, that you could predict it I mean statistics can show show a lot of information I just I, I, I just wonder about about that particular thing because people are are, are, it's, it's the same argument you're having against a sales tax. It's very hard to predict what people are going to do. Well, and, and to give you kind of an example how large numbers kind of uh, uh, balance things, uh, we were listening to a TED Talk, me and the mistress, uh, from a, a woman. She's she's a musical artist who decided to use a... Sh she went with this whole idea that people are going to steal my music. And so what she did is she gave it away and then asked for donations, and she ended up making like more money than, than all these other artists who are trying to sell their music. Uh, but she was talking about what she did previously for work before she came, became a musical artist. She painted herself up and was a statue in the street. And she was talking about how predictable her income was. She could tell you on any given day about how much she was going to make. And when you have a large number of people, you can say a, this percentage of people yeah. is going to give money. And she was able to budget with that job. 
Yeah. Um, so to kind of, of move past this, I think we've kind of established that um, there was a time in the early United States where, for the most part, except for in these very Puritan-dominated uh, colonies, um, at least certain forms of gambling were very permissible. Um, well, there's a lot of history between then and now. Okay. Um, oh, okay. Are, are we moving through the history, or are we moving past history? We're not. Okay. Um, what I was actually going to address was this kind of transition where we went from um, a lot of forms of gambling being very um, seen as gentlemen's sports um, to in the early 1800s when there started to be a movement against gambling. Um, and there was actually, um, you started, before this, you had started to see a lot of professional gamblers that um, were becoming more and more a part of society. Um, there were a couple of things that started to happen right about the same time um, that started pushing the vast majority of society toward a negative view of gambling, one of which was um, that Congress had actually passed approval for a, um, a lottery to be held in 1823 for the beautification of Washington, D.C. And um, so a lot of people participated in this lottery. And what actually ended up happening was that um, the organizers of this particular lottery, they did kind of like um, what Texas does with their state lottery and had kind of um, farmed it out to uh, some private individuals. So these individuals had organized this lottery and then the winner actually never got paid. These people just kind of took off with all of the money from the lottery. So... Um, you know, the government di didn't make any money to beautify Washington, D.C. The winner didn't get paid. Um, and there was suddenly um, a lot more public perception that, you know, gambling is bad. There are these risks that are involved, uh, which is funny that that was a gamble in and of itself. Go ahead. That's not exactly true that the winner didn't get paid. Okay. Um, so what happened was, so it was a multi-level lottery. <coughs> The grand prize of which being $100,000, which was a lot then. Um, there were other smaller prizes. Now, the people who won the smaller prizes actually gave up and said, well, the guy ran off. The grand prize winner sued the federal government, took it to court, and the courts ruled that the federal government had to pay him out. Okay. Well, he wasn't paid by from the lottery funds, I guess was what I was trying to yes, say. Yes, th that is true. Yeah. Interesting. And now, the other thing was... Um, so there became a lot more prevalence of professional gamblers. Um, you know, these people were uh, primarily on the riverboats and things like that. Um, and then they kind of started to spread out into cities around the river. Um, and there was, so, you know, as, as we look at history, we see that there's a lot of economic prosperity um, along riverbanks and along um, coastal regions and things like that. Um, so there were a lot of people traveling through, a lot of business people, um, you know, kind of taking that frontier spirit and, and trying to go and make a life, a life for themselves somewhere else. So they typically had a good bit of money on them. And I, I want to uh, interject real quick. You, you bring up a good point. And through my readings, um, this was never explicitly stated in anything I read. But if you, if you kind of read between the lines um, and, and look at where things were in history at any given time and the attitude in both geographic area and time period toward gambling, when times are really good, people see it as harmless fun that doesn't matter. And when times get bad, they see it as a way of cheating the poor out of their hard-earned dollars. Yeah. yeah. I wanted to get into that that idea, though, uh, class, class warfare with gambling. Mm -hmm. Because what ended up happening was we started defining different types of gambling in different ways. Right. Uh, you know, Poker was bad. Dominoes was bad. Uh, a roulette was bad. That was bad gambling, and that, right. that, that people started frowning on that because that was the gambling of the poor. Right. Horse racing was still huge. Yeah. Uh, and President Andrew Jackson raised race horses. Uh, George Washington ra raised race horses. That that was something that, that was considered to be good. That was in the purview of the wealthy men. Dog races. That was good gambling. That was in the purview of the wealthy men. You know, I find that really interesting that you bring up Jackson because. Um, there's actually significant evidence to kind of suggest that he was a uh, he was addicted to gambling and yet he kind of escaped some of the more negative stereotypes of 
um, gamblers because of the types of gambling that he chose. He was oh, not a gambler. He was a gentleman. Exactly. He was. Gentleman. He, was he, he, he had won and lost fortunes. Yes. I, right. Andrew Jackson was a was a severe gambler, uh, as was was uh, Ulysses S. Grant. Right. Uh, you, you know, it, it kind of goes with the drinking that that, uh, that Grant yeah. did, I guess. Yeah. But again, the idea there is that. Uh, that you know something is good for the upper class, but it's not good for the lower class, right. and I think we're still seeing that today. The idea that the lottery, you know, those people out there, the lottery is bad because it plagues on the lower classes. Yeah. But but you know we can go to enter this report to the, the horse races, and that, that's just fine. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, and, and it comes from this idea that the rich have the money to gamble; they're they're not going to shirk their responsibilities. Although that's not always true, you know the. The owner of Macy's gambled himself so far into debt that finally, the uh, after he had incorporated, the board kicked him out of his own company, and he was later, ironically, arrested for loitering outside of a Macy's. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, so that's, first of all, th- this idea that um, rich people won't, won't gamble themselves in, into trouble isn't necessarily true, but the idea is the poor will do that and the rich won't, but what it really comes down to when you look at it I appreciate the, the, the heartfelt emotion in the argument, but what it says at the end of the day is that, well, poor people just aren't intelligent enough and, and, and they, they aren't responsible enough to people to manage how they spend their money. We need to manage it for them. They're not like rich people. I think it, it comes down to that there's a, there's class where there's a difference in the people. Yeah. It's not the class. It's the people are, that are different. Well, and, and I think this will actually be a really interesting episode all on its own because something that I do want to tackle is an idea that when we look historically um, is kind of admitted, um, but I think it actually stands today even that um, there is, that wealthy people are morally superior to uh, poor people, um, that wealthy people are intellectually superior to that, poor people. That goes back to the idea of the social gospel. Right. Uh, and, and, you know, in the progressive era, the, the early 1900s, late 1800s, mm-hmm. the idea out there was that, that God, and this was a, this was a hang-on from Puritanism, mm-hmm. and this idea of that, that everything was... was uh, Preordained. That if you had more money, yeah. it meant that you had worked you, harder yes. and you hadn't had as much leisure. You hadn't had you a, must, as much waste. You must be a, I'm going to use the, the word holier. You must right. be a holier person because God has rewarded you with this. That poor, po- that poor homeless person over there that gambles all the time, he must have lived his life wrong because God preordained him for this. Exactly. Um, so, which, you know, I, I think we could do a whole episode on that, um, is an interesting idea because... How could you have lived your life wrong if God preordained you for this? Because you lived your life how God preordained you. Yeah, yeah. It's an interesting philosophical hole in the argument. I would, I would, I would like argument. to do a whole a whole uh, discussion on uh, the doctrine of predestination one of these days. Okay, so um, with this idea of professional gamblers, um, it came about that actually um, people, uh, groups of people, vigilantes. Um, Began like, like Batman, <laughs> um, like asshole man. No, like, like John Wayne. Yeah, they began um, kind of a movement against these professional gambler- gamblers. They were running them out of town. Um, in many cases, they were even lynching them, um, and it actually became kind of violent. Um, yeah, there there were gambler lynch mobs, and we see this a lot throughout history. Where <laughs> what happens is that. The, the, the initial anger in the people doesn't start toward the guy at a pool table playing pool against somebody gambling. It, it, it's against the big casinos. It's against mm-hmm. the professional gamblers. It, it's against the big institutions making the money on it. They feel cheated somehow that they lost this gamble. Um, and, you know, you, you, never, you never hear about the gamblers' lynch mobs uh, because it just wasn't as big a social issue as... Um, the uh, lynch mobs for the blacks and and, yeah. and all this, but what you what you do get to see kind of a piece of it in history is you know you you see the movie where they're playing a game of cards and somebody has that that thing come that, out of their, their yeah. sleeve that where there's cards ace yeah. up his sleeve yeah and all, this, all of a sudden there's there's a bar fight coming out. Um, a lot of that is historically inspired by what wasn't necessarily cheating might have been. Mm-hmm. Uh, but was definitely what they perceived to be somebody kind of 
practicing the uh, the 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 ter- the duels, or right. you know. Well, and the thing about it was, these professional gamblers, in many ways, um, had resorted to um, hustling. Yeah. Or yeah. what we're calling it now. Um, they had resorted to hustling. And so there were games like uh, the one on the pool table where you like you lay a pool cue across the table and you say, I bet I can roll this cue ball under this pool stick. For for people who, who don't know, it, 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 what she's talking about is, is a... Uh, well, go ahead and finish it out. And, and classic. Okay. Classic. Yeah. So basically, um, the distance between the the slate on the table and the bottom of the cue stick is not a, enough to actually roll a cue ball underneath it. The cue ball is bigger than that. But, so you get somebody to take this bet. No, you can't do that. I, I, I know physics and that you can't like squish the ball and make it go under there. And then, so they take the bet and you take the ball and you roll it underneath the table. Now I know I've kind of like ruined... <laughs> <laughs> All you have that used that, 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 that trick before, uh, you can send your hate mail to Anna. At yeah, go ahead. Philosophy. Um, and, hey, if that one got ruined for you, you can also put it on a bar turntable in the pocket <laughs> and roll it under Oh, yeah, there's that, too. So, anyway, um, they resorted to things like hustles, or, as they were called back then, confidence games. Um, and then, of course, there was cheating as well. Um, but, so, there was the combination of um, of these... You know, especially this particularly large lottery that got ruined because somebody, you know, the people who organized it stole all the money. And then these professional gamblers um, that created a movement where society became, had a much more negative perception of gambling. Um, which which led to a, a whole bunch of, um, of prohibition laws in various different states and colonies um you know you had new york that ironically enough um really early on outlawed pinball this was a whole uh, yeah. big thing uh, and it stayed out stayed illegal for uh, i mean until for a really long very time. very recently yeah yeah um until there was a court case in which um the plaintiff i suppose i think if i remember right um was able to demonstrate to the court that um, it was a game of skill, not a yeah. game of chance. So, so let, let me elaborate on that. Um, the, the the plaintiff, if I remember correctly, was an establishment that wanted to have pinball. They brought in a quote-unquote expert witness who happened to be one of the pinball champions at the time, and he was demonstrating that he could, in fact, control pinball well enough right. that, that he could just continually win at this game. But they, they brought in an expert witness who was like the greatest pinball yeah, player yeah. of the time yeah uh interestingly enough if you're a pachinko fan i don't know if y'all have ever played that they, they sometimes call it chinese pinballs the oh, okay. games that, that sit upright uh the reason they came to the united states was because pachinko was a way that you could get around the pinball requirement in, in new york huh. um we've all, we always find ways to get around this stuff we, mm-hmm. we always have uh and it, it, it's always interesting to me you know we talk about this class warfare and this idea that uh uh you know, gambling is bad and this. And the same people that did that end up putting all of their investment in the stock market. Right. And I don't know of a, of a single bigger gamble than that. I know. <laughs> you know, you're saying, I bet that these stocks that I'm putting in this company are going to increase in value. And, and you're betting the the amount of money that you spent on those stocks um, that that's going to happen. Well, I think the, the, the real issue here and, and the, reason, the the difference... Let's say it that way. The difference in the two, and it's a subtle difference that I think most people who engage in either one don't realize, well, maybe the stock market people, um, is that there is a net positive drift in the stock market. The reason is, is while all this gambling behind the scenes is going on in the stock market, where people are trading options and do, doing all this this really crazy stuff that most people don't even understand. Yeah, yeah. Um, to, to make a buck off the next guy who's going to lose a buck, while all that's happening, the hundred thousand dollars that gets gambled is going to a company that makes bolts. Right. And they're using the hundred thousand dollars to buy metal 
to create new products and 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 and, and, and turn out bolts. And when they do that, a profit is made. So money is getting injected into the system. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of the opposite of a of a rake. If if anyone's a gambler and play yeah. poker and knows what that is, it's where the casino slowly takes money out of the pot. There's slowly being money put into the pot. You're you're, you're growing the growing the amount of wealth. Right. So over the long term, there's a a net positive drift. People make money. If you just put money in the stock market yeah. and leave it for 50 years, you'll come back with more money. Yeah, rule of nines. It's, it's, it's average to 9% growth over its lifetime. Yeah, as long as you diversify and do yeah. do the right things. So there's a net positive drift. Over over a long period of right. time. Yeah. Over a long period of time, not day traders. If you're day trading, yeah. the, the drift you're, doesn't matter to you. You're a gambler. Yeah. So yeah, there's this net positive drift where people are like, well, this helps poor people. This helps people where there's a net negative drift on a lot of other kinds of gambling. And, and so the idea is, well, this hurts people. And it, it comes back to this, this debate I was speaking of earlier. What should government's role be? Should they then outlaw anything that over a long period of time people are going to lose that? Well, that's going to hurt people over a long period of time. That's it. We are, we are outlawing the American farmer. Right. Uh, because <laughs> yeah. I mean, you want to talk about a gamble. I mean, you're, 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 you're planting this crop. You're gambling the weather's going to be right. You're gambling uh, that people are going to want that product. Well, the government fixed that. They subsidized well, the farming. the government did something. They yeah, didn't right. fix it. Well, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that, that's a good point. But you know what I'm saying. Yeah. It, does the government need to come in when people are and say, you know what, you don't really know how to manage money. We're going to do it for you. Yeah. Well, you know, and I, think, um, I think that's a good term transition into the idea of choice as a gamble. So, is there any more history that anybody has that we want to go over? No, but I do want to mention, if, if you're about to switch topics, it's a good time to rate the beer. That is a I very a good point. Idea. I'm I think I need, more beer. I, I need more beer. No, you, you I can't talk. Any more beer. <laughs> you don't need any more. Who's going to start? Um, I'll go ahead. This is a wonderful beer. I'm going to take a swig real quick. God, it is a good beer. I like this one. Um... It's Flying Monks it's by cool. Adalbert's Brewery. Out of Austin, Texas. Um, it's got a bit of those bitter notes that I like, but it's, it's, it's also got some complexity on the back end. Maybe a bit of citrus or fruit, would you would you say? There, there's something there that's got a bitterness to it. I, 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 I'm not tasting citrusy. It's like orange peel, though. Yeah, I, I yeah. can see that. Yeah. yeah. So, so I really like it. Um it's it's definitely uh, uh, strong enough. It's a uh, what ten point nine? Yeah, it 10. is ten point nine. Um, it's it's got a lot of head. So uh, these guys, when they opened theirs, they poured it and they started drinking. I actually poured mine and waited and poured it and, and actually got a full glass. Um, I'm not a huge fan of, of the head on it. it. It doesn't taste bad, but I don't think it adds anything to the beer. Um, but overall, uh, when it's all said and done, I'm gonna give it a three seven. Three seven. That's a pretty high ranked Ooh. beer. Go ahead. You want me to go? Yes, uh, I do. I, I actually like the head on this beer. I think it I think it has a good flavor to it. Uh, I don't, you know, I don't I don't want a lot of it, but I like my beer to have a little bit of a head to it. Right. Um, there's a, it, it's very full flavored on the back end. Uh, as y'all said, there's a, there's a, just a little bit of a bite, but it's not that it's not that IPA it's bite. It's not aggressive. It's, there's not not very aggressive. Yeah. Um, I like it. It's smooth. It goes down easy. There's something creamy about it. I don't know what that cream is that I'm that I'm getting in there. Um, I'm going to go with a 3-3. Three, 3-3. Three. Three, three. You, you guys are being kind of harsh today. I really, really like this beer. Um, I don't know. I. How is a 3-3 three, three and a 3-9 harsh? <laughs> it was a 3-3 three, three and a 3-7. Oh, I'm sorry. That's true. But um, I'm going to give this beer an even 4. Um, you know, I've liked a lot of what you guys have said about this beer. She can't even stop stop drinking it long enough to make her uh, her statement here. It's true. Um, but it's really smooth. It's really flavorful. Um, but, you know, like you mentioned earlier, it's not aggressive. So um, generally, I really like it. So it gets an even four. The 10.9% alcohol gave it a little bit there, too. Yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> If we're honest. Okay, so anyway. Hey, right, but before we move on, I, I want to give a, a shout-out to Jacob Mackey. We were actually down at Adelbert's Brewery. There was a... Uh, a late a, October. It was late October. There was a, um event going on called Shoot the Beard. It was, it was for a friend of ours. really didn't have anything to do with the story. But uh, he introduced me to 
uh, the Flying Monk and to the Philosopher. Yeah. And uh, it's been great. We want to come out and do a show out there. We really do. Uh, we, we don't really have don't. a time scheduled, and we're gonna have to just kind of see how things go. But but w- Jacob, we're still planning on coming if we can. And uh, thank you very much. These are great beers. Yeah. They are. They are. Maybe we can get him a get him a microphone. Let him talk to us too. Well, uh, maybe we can. There's another gentleman, and I don't have his name off the top of my head. In fact, the only reason I have Jacob's because he gave me a card. So yeah. Uh, I'm horrible with names, but he is the brewmaster. He actually talked to us some down there, and I would like to, when we go down there, get him on the show and uh, come talk beer a little bit. Absolutely. That, that, would, be, that would be awesome. That yeah. would be awesome. We'll let you all know when we do that, so if you're in the Austin area, you can join us. For Absolutely. That. We love having people come out whenever we do a live recording. So anyway, um, this thing that we were going to talk about, um, it, it kind of occurred to me um I, I was actually having a discussion with my mom, um, funnily enough, and the thing that we were talking about was um, an investment that John actually made in Elio. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you want to tell exactly what the deal was there? It was like you. I want one. <laughs> yeah. So the Elio cool. is a car. I, I got in what you, uh, a year and a half ago. Year and a half. Yeah. Um, so the Elio is a car, and, and Paul Elio is the founder of the company, and his dream was to make a car. It's a two-seater, and, and they're not next to each other. They're uh, lined front up to back. front to back, yeah. So um, he wanted to make a car for $6,800 that got 84 miles to the gallon, had three wheels. The front two wheels drive the thing, and the back wheel just kind of sits back there and rolls, so the ass does drag, it. yeah. And uh, he had this whole dream, and he was kind of using crowdfunding in a weird way to get get his 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 dream off the ground. And there were different levels of donation, all the way down to a hundred dollars, and all the way up to a thousand dollars, with two different tracks from there. One's refundable if the whole thing falls apart, you get your money back, and the second type is non-refundable. So you're just saying, I want to give this money, and I, I want to see what happens. I put in a thousand dollars. All in uh, a non-refundable donation. Now, the advantage to the non-refundable donation was that if you put it in non-refundable, they'd give you one and a half times the donation as credit toward your car, and you got the the first the first batch that came out. Um, I put this in, and the the dates been pushed back a lot. Um, uh, there's been a lot of things going against this car. A lot of times when it could have failed. Uh, recently. Um, there's been a program that Congress pushed through uh, with the with the FEC to let co- small companies who want to make a small IPO offering, um, IPO initial public offering offering, right? But uh, uh, want to make a small IPO to do it without going through a lot of the 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 red tape that right. other companies have to. Um, they've recently been approved for it. They're they're going to raise fifty million dollars off that. They've already raised. Uh, I want to say seventy-five million. I don't remember the number. Yeah. And then they're they're going to be about two hundred million short, and they have a loan application in with another company, and they've raised a third of the money needed, um, and it's looking very good that they're going to get this. So basically, what it came down to is is I made a gamble on this thousand dollars that I was going to get to to be one of the first owners of this car that really uh, spoke to me a lot on on a, on a lot of the uh, the issues I'm passionate about. Plus, I was a car I just wanted to own. Um, but I may get nothing for my $1,000. Uh, it was absolutely a gamble. Um, and it's looking now, just, just real recently, because a little while ago I would have told you I'm just I'm going to sit around because I don't think it's going to happen. Um, it's looking now like I might have won on that gamble. I, I'd have thought six months ago that it wasn't it, that it was going to fail completely. Yeah, um, I was kind of with you there. Well, and, and here's the deal. So the conversation that, that I was having with my mother was well over a year ago at this point. Um it was after the first time that the production date got moved. Uh, yeah. Got moved, yeah. Um, and and I was talking to her about how you know it. I th- I think that people, the people who made this investment, um, I I don't necessarily think, and I, I personally think this with a lot of things, that they were looking at it as a gamble. I I think they were looking at it kind of like. Um, Whenever you pre-order your iPhone, you know, you pre-order it. Well, this is a well-established company, and you know that production is going to happen. Um, 
but it was different in this particular aspect because this was a brand new company that had actually never produced anything before. You had no historical evidence that um, that something was going to come out of this. And so I, w- I was talking to her about, you know, I hope that these people are looking at it as a gamble, but I have a suspicion that they're not considering a lot of the negative feedback that was coming um, that was coming from the people who had made this investment. Um, and so it really got me to thinking about, and I have been thinking about this for, for probably over a year now, about how every single choice that you make in life, when you get a mortgage on a house, um, what you're doing is you're making a bet that A, you're going to be able to pay that mortgage for the next 30 years or whatever the length of your term is. Um, you know, you're making a bet that, um, this is going to be where you want to stay. You're making a bet that um, various things don't change. When you know, look you go to college. Exactly. You're making a bet that you're that that, that that whatever field you're studying for is going to be yeah a field where jobs are available. Absolutely. Right. Well, and when you whenever you choose a, a a variable interest rate versus a fixed interest rate, now there are a lot of people who do talk really bad recently because of, because of the housing crisis about a, a, a variable interest rate. You can make a lot of money taking a variable interest rate if you do it. So a variable interest rate is really good if you're going to pay your bill ahead of time, get it paid off quickly, Mm -hmm. and get out. If you're going to be responsible. Right. Right. If you aren't doing that, it's probably going to bite you in the ass. Yeah. Yeah. Especially now that the interest rate will probably, I I suspect, will be going up. But, you know, again, that's gamble. Exactly. It's a gamble. It is. I'm Um, on record saying it's going to go up. Yeah. So, anyway, um, a variable interest rate could be a really bad thing. But um, people are, are, they've now decided. They have now got it down that a variable interest rate is a horrible thing. You should never take that. And these horrible banks gave these people variable interest rates, and they just, they hurt the poor. Yeah. It's the same discussion we're having now. And you know what? I guarantee you, five, ten years from now, some point in the, hit, in the future, they're going to be like, well, they gave these people a fixed interest rate. They encouraged them to take it. And if they had taken a variable interest rate, they, they would have only had to pay half as much. And we'll be talking about that. Yeah. Life's a gamble. Yeah. Well, and, and so you look at it with these big things. You look at a home mortgage. You look at college. Um, you look at life insurance, Starting health insurance, car insurance. And let's talk about insurance for a minute. That is exactly what insurance is. Sorry about that wobble, guys. Well, that's all insurance is. It, it, it's, it's institutionalized gambling. It is. So you're paying this premium every month saying, I bet that I am going to get in an accident. And your insurance company is saying, I'm betting you're not going to get in an accident. And the negotiation, um, I guess I'm talking specifically about car insurance at this point, um, you know, the rate that your insurance company offers you is the rate that they're saying, um, you know, we're betting that um, for this amount of coverage and you pay us this much a month, um, you know, we're each putting these two things up. You've got $100,000 worth of coverage and you're paying $150 a month. Um, We're betting that you're going to pay us more before we have to pay you out. Well, and it goes deeper than that. So, I mean, this is really an instance where they found a way to make themselves look like the good guy, but the the house is fucking you on this one, right? And I, I say that not to say that it should be illegal or they're bad people. The, the the house's job is to make money, you know. Right. But what they're doing is they're coming through and saying the average person spends this much on the accents they have. We're going to charge you based on the average rate. But wait. We're also going to assume that the average person doesn't know how to invest. So we're going to invest this money, and we're going to gamble with the money, Mm -hmm. and we're going to try and make money on this. So they're they're taking the money you're gambling with, and they're gambling with it, trying to make money. And then, if you end up being a high-cost individual to them, not only have they already charged you the average, but just to drive it home, make sure they have enough money, they're then saying, well, you cost us extra. You made our gamble... uh, closer to even yeah, that so much riskier we're going to charge you more money so you're absolutely losing on insurance the deal is the reason people get it and the reason that insurance companies stay in business is they're betting and rightfully so that you're not responsible enough to do all this for yourself yeah they're offering the service of managing your money 
Yeah. Well, you know, and and for instance, with car insurance, um, it is a legal requirement that you get liability insurance. Now, you can um, sidestep that legal requirement to get liability insurance as long as you can prove that you are financially capable, I think the wording is. Financially responsible. I think that's it. state law, isn't it? That's yeah. not. Yeah, that's oh, state law. Okay, state. so in, in Texas, you don't have to get liability insurance on your vehicle if you can prove that you have uh, that you have the finances to, if you are at fault in an accident, um, pay for the repairs to the other person's vehicle. So um, I don't remember exactly what the number is. Um, I think it's a hundred thousand dollar bond, or or a hundred thousand dollars in the bank, or six or more cars. Is that the number of cars? Remember. I can't remember. Very like few people qualify for it. it so. Yeah, yeah it, it's difficult to qualify for. Um, <coughs> but so if you look at um, insurance companies in general. You know, life insurance is saying that, you know, you're not going to die before you've paid out this much to us. Um, they are today's hustlers. They are institutionalized hustlers. Because as you mentioned, John, um, they have the game stacked for them. They take your money, um, you know, they provide you this particular rate. And while uh, with the money that you're paying to them they're making money on the back end um so it is absolutely stacked in their favor now um something that i want to look at is you know we have these these things that are well established that these are gambles well i i want to stop you for just a second because you you mentioned them being the hustlers um i want to say at least for me i can't speak for what you were meaning when you say that I don't think the hustler's a bad guy. I don't either. And it, it's it's in, in modern terminology, it's it's become common that we say, well, he's a hustler, he's a bad man, and, and and I think it's just a guy trying to make a living. Now, I think there's a an economic discussion that could be had on someone trying to make a living without producing a product. But all of that that conversation aside, um, I, I want to make sure at least that that's understood. That at least for me, and it seems like for the mistress, that. We're not necessarily putting a negative connotation when we say the hustler. We're just saying that's what they do. Yeah. Well, I mean, honest hustling. Yeah. Honest hustling I don't have a problem with. Yeah. Well, I and, have a and problem with dishonest hustling. I have a problem with cheating. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and, and to clarify that, but the difference in honest hustling and dishonest hustling is lying about the terms versus making terms where where you're being honest. They're just stacking your favor. Yeah. Yeah. There's total difference there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, to give an example, um, our son, uh, I, I pack his lunch to school every single day. Now, um, he would rather eat much less healthfully than we do at home. Um, and more often than not, he, he picks at his meal if he eats any of it. Um, and so a few days ago, him and John made a bet. Um, that if we gave him half an orange, he would. He said, if we gave him half an orange, he would eat the whole thing. And John said, no, you won't, because historically, he doesn't. No matter what we send with him, he doesn't eat at all, which is fine, you know, whatever. He's getting, he's being provided with the food, and if he eats it or doesn't, that's his own thing. Um, and so they negotiated terms of the bet. Do you want to go into more detail with that? Because I wasn't paying attention through the whole thing. Uh, I, I, I mean, it's controversy. So, uh, I, I guess we can. Um, I don't think there's much of a story there to be told. So anyway, uh, we we negotiated this bet, um, and and the bet was uh, he wanted us. It, it had more to, less to do with him him eating lunch, but it said he, he he wanted us to eat an orange that night. We didn't have any oranges, and and he said, and we'll each eat, eat a half an orange, and if you send the other half to me, to me with me to school. I'll eat it at school. And I'm like, no, you won't. And my reasoning had more to do with he's not going to eat an orange because it's, been, cause it's a long weekend for, for a Thanksgiving holiday. Uh, you're not going to eat an orange that's been, set, that's been you know, peeled for like six days now. Mm-hmm. And he will know I will. And he won't think about it. So anyway, um, a bet was made and he, he said he would eat everything and then... 
Uh, he didn't want to. He was like, "Well, I'm not gonna eat the pig." Yeah, which inherently included like he was gonna eat the the rind and everything, <laughs> which is like disgusting. And I'm sitting here thinking, this kid's just gonna throw the whole thing in the trash and be like, "I won the bet." Yeah. So <laughs> then, so he 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 made some alterations to the bet after it happened, and then I said, "Well, you have to eat it when you get home." And you know, th- there was there was so much like controversy over over what things meant in the bet that we finally at the end said, "I said, you know what." I'll make you a deal. We can't agree on what the bet means. We'll just call the bet off. And so a bet was never struck. I, I don't think it's that. So the whole story that I was looking at there was um, this idea of um, of honest hustling. Reaching an agreement. Right. Exactly. So um, he could say, well, I'm going to eat the whole thing. Well, to him, that means he's going to eat the whole meat. But to John, that means he's going to eat the meat and the rind. So l- let's put this in, in another way. So Mike... I'm going to roll a cue ball under a pool stick. Is that an <laughs> honest hustle or not? That's perfectly honest. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you've given all of the, uh, all of the requirements. Uh, to me, the dishonest thing would be, uh, and it's not even a, a pool table thing, but cards, if you're, if you're can, or if you've got cards up your sleeve or you've got something like that, that's cheating. You're, you're introducing new right. cards yes, to the deck yes, and all that's, that. That's, okay, that's yeah. different. That's, yeah. That's, that's, yeah, so I have a card, problem with that. So card counting to you is okay? Card counting is a skill. Yeah, that's fine. Card counting is absolutely a skill, <laughs> and it's <laughs> impressive. And, and and I don't have problems. It's a skill, but you will get thrown out of the casinos <laughs> for it. You <laughs> will. Actually, they won't throw you out of the casinos. They'll, they'll flat bet you. Hmm? So what they do whenever they catch someone card counting is they usually say, you're allowed to play, but the shoe, do you know what a shoe is? Yeah. For well, for everyone at home, the shoe means all the decks that they use in a, in a game of uh, 21, and then they, they, when the shoe is empty, they take it and reshuffle everything, right? So they say, whatever you bet in the first hand of the shoe, you have to bet that through the entire shoe, um, and then you can change it the next shoe, but they, they do what's called flat bet, and you, you cannot raise or lower your bet. You bet one amount for every hand. Interesting. Oh, okay. Very interesting. See, I has this maybe changed in in maybe recent years? Yes, it has. Okay. See, in the old days, the mob bosses would break your knees <laughs> and get the money back, but now they just flat bet you. I've got a good friend of mine that lives in Vegas, and uh, when I went down to see him, he told me that uh, uh, Vegas was a <laughs> wonderful place when the mob ran it because there was no crime uh, because... But, <laughs> But the mob had a had a monopoly on the crime, mm-hmm. and if you you know if you were a purse thief or anything else, you just disappeared. <laughs> so wonderful, wonderful, interesting. So anyway, so where I wanted to go from here was we've established several several ways in which um, I I at least perceive these to be very known bets. These are things that you're gambling on. Mortgages, life insurance, health insurance, bank account, uh, bank account all of these various things. But I think you also have to look at um, when you decide to get in your car and drive somewhere, you're betting that you are actually going to arrive at that place. You're driving a half ton or a one and a half ton, depending on what vehicle you're driving. This is Texas. It's it's, 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 it's big one and a half ton trucks. <laughs> yeah. You, you know, and, and talking about life's a gamble. We often, and some people are more critical, people have different views on this, but we often have strong views <coughs> on people in the military and their death rates. Mm-hmm. But it's ironic that you are more likely to die driving to and from your base than you are in Iraq. Yeah. 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 Um, so, you're betting that in, in driving this, um, this projectile at 70 miles an hour that despite all of these risks that you're taking, you're going to get to your destination. Um, You can even look at it with time. You can say that I am betting that leaving with 30 minutes to get from point A to point B, and Google Maps says that it takes 28 minutes to get there, that you're actually going to get there on time. You're betting that... I make that bet every morning on the way to work. Absolutely. Every morning. You're betting that there's not going to be an accident that delays you. You're betting that there's not going to be um, a checkpoint for whatever reason on your way to work at 6 in the morning. Um, You're betting that nothing is going to happen between then, uh, between home and work that is going to delay you to getting there. Um, So you look at it and every single thing that you do in life is a bet. Whenever you accept a job somewhere, 
you're betting that the amount that you and your employer have negotiated is going to be worth the work that you're doing. That um, the amount of labor that you are required to put in is worth the amount of money that you're being paid to do that work. Um, you know, when you invest in your 401k, um, you're betting that the return on that is going to be acceptable to you. So, I guess a question that enters my mind is, I think we all agree that everything you do is a, is a gamble, is a risk. Yeah. But I think there's a clear difference. There, there are some clear lines between most other risks and the quote-unquote what we call gambling, when we talk about gambling law. And the idea is that, that and, and this is an economic issue that a lot of people have with gambling, that one of those is producing something at the end of the day. The, the, what I talked about earlier, the net positive drift yeah. and net negative drift. I'm just, at the, we're going to get a lottery together, and at the end of the day, we just traded dollars. We came with $10, we traded it, and if there was, there was someone who facilitated the whole thing, but they might have taken three dollars out of thing, and at the end of the day, we'll well, but isn't isn't the entertainment value a net product that you've created at the end of the day? There uh, is, <coughs> because if it's not, why are you going to a movie? Well, and, and that's the, that's a good point, and 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 kind of what I want to get back to is we establish that there's risk with everything, right? But does that apply to what we've talked about here, which is gambling law, which is defined a little bit differently than? Well, there's a risk with every. There's a risk with running for Congress, so nobody should do. You know, we don't define things this way. So, what does the philosophy of gambling in the the classical sense? You know, where does that come in? Um, you know, we look at it and gambling in casinos. Um, you know, kind of like Mike pointed out with, um, you know, you go to the movies and you're betting that this movie is going to be worth the $8.50 that you're paying to get into the movie. Um, it's the entertainment value. It has been shown time and time again through studies that um, that uh, gambling releases endorphins that make you happy. Um, I, I think you're saying that the amount of money that I am risking here is worth the amount of, of feel good because endorphins make you feel good is worth the amount of feel good that I'm going to get from it. Well, y you are saying that, and and whenever you do anything, you're saying that that the way this makes me feel is is worth it. Whether it's you feel good because you're earning money, or you feel good because you're helping charity, or you mm -hmm. feel good because you might win a million dollars. Um, but the very, and I, I, I'm, I'm going to use the classical word, but there have probably been political movements since then. John said very. The, uh, I'm the, letting it go. <laughs> the damn, 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 not very. But anyway, the political. The, the, the political view is goes back to that Puritan view mm -hmm. of if you're wasting time, if you're not producing yeah. something, and a lot of these what we call classical gamblings, they don't produce anything. They're just wasting time. I, I'm saying this from a Puritan view. I'm a gambler myself, so, I, you know, I'm, I'm not... I'm just trying to, to look at the philosophy of wh why should we, or why shouldn't we, I'll, I'll take it, the question from either side, allow completely frivolous time gambling? <coughs> okay. Um, I look at several people sitting around a poker table playing poker and betting their money doing that is no different than a few guys getting together and saying we are going to put our money together and bet that this business idea comes to fruition and is profitable um, you know some people are going to lose and some people are going to win yeah so the the difference there fr from a from a, a puritanical standpoint, yeah, a puritanical mm -hmm. standpoint is they're producing something. They're coming together. They're trying to make something. They're trying to make society better. They're trying to produce something tangible. No, they're trying to make society. The the business they could be doing is they could be we're going to put each other through law school, and then we're going to s sign documents. You know, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, these legal documents need to exist. They're trying to produce something. I don't care if it's physical or not. Mm 
Well, and I, I, well, I think she's arguing, though, that the, the other side, sitting, sitting there at, the, at that poker table, does produce something. It's not tangible. What it produces is joy. Yeah. It produces entertainment. I mean, um, when you and I were playing poker fairly regularly, not frequently, but regularly, um, we were looking at it and going, I can take $20 and I can play poker for six hours. Whereas, if I took $20 and went to the movie theater... I'm through in an hour and a half. Exactly. I'm, yeah. I'm through in an hour and a half. And I frankly enjoy sitting around this table playing poker I've got to with say, these people that I know and I, and I enjoy spending time with. I've got to say, I've seen y'all play poker and, and, and $20 for six hours is, 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 is pretty small pretty small money for y'all. Well, it, it is. <laughs> well, we were making those arguments and more had to do with sometimes we leave with $600, sometimes we leave down $200. Yeah. And if you average it out, we're spending yeah. $20 per, yeah. you know. Yeah. yeah, I mean, if you average it out, we're losing the same as we would if we took that same $20 and went to the movies each time. Yeah, yeah. You know? Uh, I, I'll tell you, I, I'm coming from a little different perspective because y'all know me, I'm not really a gambler. Yeah. Right? Every now and then I'll do something, but uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't gamble, and it's because i got enough sense to know that I can't quit if I start. Right. So I just, uh, I, I don't gamble. But I don't think it's the state's responsibility to protect me from my own weakness. Absolutely. I am not a good gambler because I don't know how to quit, but I don't want the state to come through and tell me I can't gamble. Right. You give me the right numbers, I'm going to jump in there still. So there you uh, go. That, that's just kind of the way things, uh, things are. So I think, you know, philosophically, yeah, we should have a right to gamble. We should have a right to do something. And yes, you are producing something. You're producing contentment. You're producing joy. Yeah. Um, and sometimes if you're lucky, you're producing cash in your pocket. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it's not any different than any other entertainment industry. So I, I'm going to give you my view on the thing. I absolutely think gambling should be legal. I think everybody who came into this podcast knew that. Anyone who knows me, let me say it that way. Uh, knew Unless that you're new. But if you listen to our old episodes, you'll see. But knew, knew that I was going to come down there. But my view is if you can... Oh, boy. I'd already finished mine. I'm good. <laughs> uh, I'll finish mine in a second. Um, so, but if, if you come to the, to the idea that... <coughs> You all right? I'm dying. Okay. The, the mistress is dying. By the way, if you're listening out there, uh, beer was just spilled. If you're playing along with us at home, finish your drinks. Yep. Um, but if you come to the idea that because this is a net negative drift or this, this isn't producing something, this is people trading money, say what you want about it, uh, that gambling should be illegal, I can respect your philosophy, your idea, if you can equally agree that TV should be illegal. Yes. If you can agree. I mean, <laughs> no. <laughs> and, and the mistress is saying this because me and her don't own a TV. But if you can say that this time-wasting activity that doesn't produce a thing should be illegal, which uh, most people in America are not, then I can at least respect your view. I'm going to disagree with you. Right. Um, but, I, I, you know, to, to Mike's point, I think it produces the same thing. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. So I think we're kind of all on the same page on the philosophy of gambling anyway. Yeah. Well, and, and to be entirely honest, when I proposed this topic, I didn't expect that any of us were going to be in different places. Um, but I thought it was something worth kind of talking about and, and thinking about. There is one more section I'd kind of like to talk about because I'm curious uh, about uh, childhood gambling. And, you know, we have we have all kinds of rules about when you can gamble uh, you know 18, 21 depends on what state you're in uh, but you know it's illegal to gamble in the state of Texas uh, for, for the most part we don't have casinos in Texas mm -hmm. uh, but I don't know how many times I've sat there on senior night when kids graduate and you've got casino night where, oh, yeah. where, where they're doing this and, and they're not gambling for money but they're gambling for tokens and they get prizes at the end right. of the night that's gambling. That, that's, it is. You're running a casino at that point. It absolutely so is. So I'm curious about what y'all's opinion is on, on that and your opinion it would be on uh, on age restrictions for gambling. So I'm going to kind of take this in two parts. First is, is the, the legal definition of what we call de gambling. And second is more of a philosophical. So when we talk about gambling, it has to involve money, which is a real interesting thing lately because um, still to this day, cryptocurrencies are not considered money. So there's we been could a open a, a Bitcoin casino. 
We Ooh. could, and until recently, that was going to be that was completely legal in the U.S. until it got reclassified as a commodity. Oh, okay. But yeah, so we can't gamble commodities. So it. It's this whole thing. So, how about sexual favors? Can we open up a sexual favors casino? You have to do that in the privacy of your own home or business. <sighs> but I'd want to lose business, every business. time. <laughs> I know you would. <laughs> so no, but but anyway. So we talk about this, and for in, the, first of all, the law is really bad at, at defining gambling because, as the mistress has pointed out so many times, everything's a risk. So you cannot law risk. That would like immobilize Absolutely. the country. Everybody so you might just stay at home wrapped in <laughs> bubble wrap. Yes. You could suffocate. <laughs> <laughs> it's a risk. But anyway, so you can't outlaw that. So you then have to like put these really weird parameters on it and it's real easy to, to put gambling right outside that. Yeah. We'll all buy a teddy bear, we'll gamble the teddy bears and sell them back in the night, you know? Yeah. Um so that, that's kind of my view from the, from a legal standpoint is the law is not well equipped to handle this and I think history has shown that gambling has, has, has gone on in spite of the law so let's talk about the philosophy um, I think the really easy answer to this that, that could solve the legal problem and solve the, the philosophy problem that you brought up of childhood gambling is the state refused to recognize contracts from an individual who is not of age. Now, bring that to the parents. So the the child cannot sign verbally or any other way a contract. So they can't agree that I'm going to owe you X if I lose. If the state comes through and says we're not going to recognize those, there'd be no legal uh, 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 repercussions to anybody who who engages in that kind of um, activity at a young age. Now, for me, me and my son, I gamble with him all the time on, on little things. And the idea has nothing to do with me wanting to gamble or hustle uh, him. It has to do with we want to, to teach, teach him, him about risk. Prepare. Right, exactly. Um, I had to learn the hard way. Yeah. It cost me a lot of money. A lot yeah. of money. He's yeah. getting to learn early. <laughs> so uh, I, I want to I wanna impart that to him. Um so, as far as my views on childhood gambling, I think it should be to the parents. And if the parents want to come up and, and, and agree to that he can do that bet, that's, that's the parent's prerogative to sign that quote-unquote contract. So, what age would you allow somebody to enter into a uh, gambling contract on their own? Now, if we're going to talk about today, it's going to be 18. But more generally, it's whenever the state says... That a person is no longer under the control of their parents or an adult. Right. An emancipated minor. Right. Okay, so we talk about childhood gambling, and I'll tell you this. Um, it, it was actually a really interesting kind of anarchical state where, uh, and, and by state, I mean state of being, not, you know, state of government. Um, I remember being in middle school. And Pokemon cards were a big deal. And I'm going to totally, like, admit my nerd self at wow. this point. Wow, Pokemon. Shut up. <laughs> Gotta catch them all. We, we were trading rocks when I was a kid. Okay, so. You had just admitted those, though. We just admitted rocks. They were brand new. Very scarce. Yes. So. There was still lava everywhere. All of the, the kids that I hung around with, we all played Pokemon. And we would have Pokemon battles I think it was called <laughs> and whenever you played a game you would bet certain cards that you had that you would win and if you lost you would give up these cards if you won you would take the other cards from somebody else so in, in today's age it would be the magic cards that they do the same thing with I have no I idea the magic's yeah. older than Pokemon well, I don't know but they're still doing magic cards I think they're still doing Pokemon I don't, I don't know. know they're doing Yu-Gi-Oh. I think. They are still doing Pokemon, actually. Really? But really? I, I saw in a line in the Walmart that they were that still that selling those them. Things are actually called, it actually means Pocket Monster, which is just hilarious to me. It is hilarious. Well, they were. They fit in these little balls, and you put them in your pocket. I have a Pocket Monster. It's a whole thing. I, I have monsters in my balls. <laughs> so anyway. Anyway. Um, so it, it was a very voluntary thing where um, we decided that we were going to play this game and you were going to put up these cards and I agreed that these cards that you put up were equal to the cards that I put up 
and and we were betting. There's no doubt about it. If you won, you received the cards that this other person put up, and if you lost, you gave up the cards that you put up. Um, and I don't have a problem with that at all. And the funny thing about it is that it was not enforced by law. It was not enforced by contract. What it was enforced by, because if you refused to give up those cards... You were shunned. You were shunned. Yeah. Nobody else would play with you because they didn't think that you would honor the arrangement that was made before the game started. Wait, are, are, you you pool all the time. Absolutely. Are, are you describing a reputation-based credit system? Absolutely I am. <laughs> that's interesting. Am. interesting. That's really interesting. <laughs> well, and that's what I was saying. It was, it was a very anarchist system. There was not law. There was not... Uh, there were no guns pointed at your head saying you had to give up these cards. All right. But there was voluntary association and disassociation. One time on our podcast uh, several months ago, John, you uh, we, we talked about, about the time in the prison, and you got very emotional and made an apology to a, uh, a, a prisoner. And it, it's my turn now uh, because my, my gambling story as a child is not nearly as good as yours. But uh, <laughs> me, and, me and my two best friends who will remain nameless, although – if y'all are listening out there, you know who you are. We used to pick a certain young lady, and we would all put 20 bucks in and put money on who could pick the girl up by the end of the night. And uh, to the young ladies that were involved, I want to apologize to you right now <laughs> for taking part in that, that horrendous gamble. Um, well, I can tell you this. Joy, joy was found, and uh, it, was, it was an interesting day. Well, I can tell you this. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to throw in my heartfelt apology. I don't know what was going on in the 70s and the early 80s that, and whatever. It would have been the late 80s. The late 80s. Okay. I, 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 was, I was a little older than... I was born in the 70s. I, How does that feel? I didn't know when you started trying to pick up girls and making bets on it. Late 70s. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> but I can tell you this. Me and my own girlfriends... <laughs> had bets on how long we could string a guy along. <laughs> so there were bets on both sides you, of that. Would you like to apologize to some of those guys? Now? No. <laughs> no, I would not. Because they knew what game they were getting into. That's right. That's right. Uh, anyways, I just wanted to share my little story there. And so I had no bets. I would have lost. <laughs> I, I lost sometimes, too. So anyway, I, I think we've clearly established that... I think um, my two friends owe apologies to those young ladies, too. I, I think they probably do. So, I, or they don't, because so everybody knew what was going on. I think on. this is real interesting. We kind of attacked this question from, from three sides. Um, I don't know that we, we got... You, you know, you brought up the, uh, the, the anarchic... I brought up that I don't think government should enforce those contracts. You, you brought up that when you were a kid, those contracts existed in spite of government. Yeah. And you apologized for <laughs> Arizona women. <laughs> so, I, I guess... I'm with, I'm with Anna. I think, I think that, that a lot of that stuff can be taken care of through... Uh, Outside know, through, of government. Through, through reputation. Absolutely. Are you saying... Well, let me ask you this. Could that same thing be taken care of by adults outside of government? I think yes. that's another podcast that we should yeah. do. Oh, okay. is it really? I think it's another podcast that we should do. Yeah, yeah, I think it could. Okay. okay. So, so what I wanted to come to with this podcast was that I hope that people will stop looking at um, at certain situations as happenstance. Um and look at them more as gambles. And and maybe that's counterintuitive to what we believe as a society, but I hope that you will, when you get in your car and you drive to work with the set amount of time that you've allotted, you'll look at that and say, I am taking a gamble. I if, am a gambler. If I can th come in here for just Go a second. Um, I've actually converted my boss on this, this same school of thought you're talking about. Is he Catholic now? <laughs> uh, not quite. Um, but when I was a co-op and, and I was working for him, um, we had a problem. I don't even remember what the problem was, but we had some problem we had to solve. And uh, in this problem, <laughs> no I, said, I said, well, let's look at it like a gambler was. And this guy looked at me like you were crazy, right? Like, what do you mean, look at it like a gambler? And I said, well, hold on. If this goes to the way we want it to, what do we have to get? What can we gain? And he said, well, obviously we'll have a more efficient process. We'll have this and that. And I said, okay. Damn. Yeah, my bad. Um, 
if this thing doesn't go our way, what do we have to lose? He said, well, this could go wrong and we could spend this much money. And I said, okay, is the reward worth the risk? And at that point, I kind of saw, saw it in his look like, okay, I see, I, I see what yeah, you're saying. Yeah. It, it makes sense now. And I was gambling a lot of the time, so it, it made sense to me already as a gambler. But he, he came he in and... to gamble on everything. Uh, oh, yeah. And I He's was, got a reputation. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, but he, he kind of saw where I was coming from there. And if you stop and, and, and look at things as a gambler, now when I say that to him, he says, oh, yeah, let's do that. It makes sense. So I, I want to just point out that not only does it make sense from a philosophical, philosophical point of view... But it makes sense from a business point of view. Well, you know, in business, the they teach you that in business. They teach you to sit down with a sheet of paper and write down on both the sides. Pros and cons. Yeah, pros and yep. cons of doing this. What, what are the advantages? What are the disadvantages? And if one out clearly outweighs the other, that's the way you should go. Yeah. That is a gambler's mindset. That's deciding whether or not you should make the bet. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and you mentioned when you were a co-op, and that's the thing. The business that you were co-oping for was betting that the experience that you got as a co-op and the loyalty that you developed as a co-op toward that company was going to benefit benefit them in the long term. They won. <laughs> they did. Um, they were betting that you were going to look at the experience that you got and say, these people really invested in me. They really helped me to develop X skill. They helped me to um, make the money that allowed me to survive while I was in college. Um, they take that and they look at it and they say, you know, we're going to make this investment in this person and hope that we get a return. And now you've been working for them for two years after you graduated, which you didn't have to do, and which whenever they hired you on as a co-op, they said, we're going to hope that whenever he does graduate, he's going to continue to work for us. And if he's not an idiot. If, if he's not an idiot. And, and they've hired... Clear, actually. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm an idiot and that continue to work for Well, and, and they've hired co-ops that they then let go or that they didn't want to keep on after they graduated. Um, and they've hired a new co-op now and are looking to hire another one. Um, that they're looking to make this bet and say, we're going to invest this in this particular person in the hopes that they are going to turn around and be profitable for our company. So that's just another example of a gamble that people are making. I think where we've all come down is that, 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 that people have a right to, to their own lives and they have a right to their own choices. Absolutely. And the government should get the hell out of the way. Yeah, well, and... and I absolutely believe that every every regulation, every law that um, inhibits or encourages gambling in either way should be repealed. Um, but the thing that I hope that individuals take from this is that absolutely everything in your life needs to be looked at as a gamble. What are you betting whenever you make this choice? And what is the thing that you are potentially going to lose? When you get in the car and you drive to work, you are potentially going to lose your life. But you're potentially going to make it to work and make some money <coughs> so that you can then invest in something else. So you can enjoy your life. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and it's interesting. I don't, I don't want to drag this podcast out any further, but it just goes to show there is a value in your life. There is a price at which you'll risk it. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, we, and we all do it. We all do it at, we some, do. at some level. So well, is there anything else that we've got to talk you about know, I, today? I think we've done a really good job here. I got to get, the, get, get my personal sins off my chest. <laughs> and, uh, and we found out that, that, that Anna doesn't at, at all concerned about her personal sins. And uh, Hold on. What? what? <laughs> if she was concerned about her personal sins, she'd have killed herself a long time or, ago. Or wouldn't have married you. Wow. Um, wow. All right, I think we've uh, we've done a pretty good job here. I this think beer we have. is wonderful. It is. I have thoroughly enjoyed this. We finished beer. them. We finished them. They're they're good. Actually, I'm not finished yet, but I will be. I want to mention one more time. This is from Adelbert's Brewery in Austin, Texas. And if you're trying to get there and you drive and you think that you've passed it, it's because it's this weird like 
warehouse looking place in a very industrial part of the uh, uh, in an, an industrial part of Austin um, you've already passed it go back if there's a beer out there that you want us to try, let us know. Uh, send it to us or, or let us know. We'll, we'll see what we can do. Yeah, and you, if there's a place that we need to go to for a show, give us a call. We'll see what we can what we can do. Uh, you can call us, I suppose. Well, I'll give you Mike's phone I'm number. Old, I'm old. Old. I say give us a call. Send us a text message. Something. <laughs> you can email us at Smoke contact signals. us at sixpackphilosophy.com. You can also find us on social media by searching Six Pack Philosophy. That's, that's the way to get us on any social media. If we're not your favorite social media let us know and we will possibly maybe try to get on there no, no. other than that um, you can also find us on Stitcher and iTunes and various podcast platforms if we're not on your favorite there though absolutely let us know by emailing us and coming soon we are on the list to be on the first release of Google Play so if you look yes. at Google Play Music and you want to get your podcast there we're there. Yeah. Subscribe, um, subscribe, subscribe. Google Play Music is expected very soon to start doing podcasts, and we are on the list to be released with those. Um, so if that's where you want to get your podcasts, um, you'll be able to find us there pretty soon. Other than that, um, we Periscope all of our podcasts so you can actually watch us as we record and this, the silly things I, that I we do. I don't know why you'd want to do that. I no, don't. here's why you would want to do that. Because we actually start recording, bef- we start recording our Periscope before we start recording our actual podcast, and a little bit after. So you get some of the little bitty behind the scenes things where we're joking around and bullshitting All with of each our other, secrets. and it's a lot of fun. It really and is. The other thing we're going to start doing, um, we've had some uh, issues with the Periscope app, a few little glitches, but as we can. We're going to take the feeds from Periscope and put them on YouTube. Mm-hmm. We are going to have a YouTube channel soon. I don't know what it's going to be called. Um, Probably Six Pack Philosophy. Well, is it going to be the number six, the word six? I don't know, but no, if no, they search Six Pack Philosophy, they'll be able to find it, right? Hopefully. Yeah, we, we would hope. Or, or you'll find porn, uh, one of the two. You'll always find porn, no matter <laughs> what you search. You can search gambling and you'll find porn. That's yeah. a good point. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. I need to do that later. But anyway, all of that said, this has been a blast, and we hope that you guys have enjoyed it. Let us know what you think about gambling. Let you let us know what you think about gambling law. Let us know, do you really think that every single choice that you make in life is actually a gamble? How do you rate the things that you do in life? Do you take into consideration uh, deliberately the risks that are involved in in the decisions that you make on a regular basis. Anyway, with all of that said, these guys are trying to play like swords with beer bottles, so I guess I should probably let you guys go. We really appreciate you listening, Thank and you we hope again. you tune in next week. Cheers. Cheers. Woo! Oh, that was loud. Oh, Lord, I got blisters on my ears. <laughs>